Well, I'm breaking the first um, stereotype today of speakers because I'm going to sit down. Uh, because you see, as a teacher, I stood up for 40 years and I deserve to sit down. <laughs> By the way, this is not a cooking show. But I tried to find something in the kitchen that reminded me of, of the brain, which is the greatest gift you guys have got. And since you've been here today, you've actually had 57,000 thoughts filter through your brain. That's a lot, isn't it? And by the time you leave here tonight, you will have had 70,000. What if the messages that are coming into our brain aren't empowered? How does that leave us? And so um, I just had a cause to remember that when I was growing up, um, I always remember my brother was leaving school and his empowerment project was the brothers took him on a bivouac, okay? So he went out there and climbed hills and put on his backpack. As for me, I went to a girls' school. Do you know what my empowering transition was when I left the girls' school? I was sat down at a table with a knife and fork and taught how to cut a pear and eat it. <laughs> because going back 200 years ago, women had no education. Um, they were all raised with the mindset that their brain did not count to such an extent that it was even suggested that their brain would implode if they were to even tempt to put anything too esoteric in it. So um, being, being in um, this situation that they had no thought, the people of the day stuck them in posture suits Terrible looking things, aren't they? These were to keep them pretty and to keep them in check. Now, when I was being raised in a neighborhood of boys, boy was I kept in check. You know, the, the gender boundaries were so clearly defined because if we played a game of cops and robbers, guess who was the one sent up to scale the tallest tree in the neighbourhood. And I'd have to sit there for endless hours looking for the next cop raid to happen. And you know what? Sometimes they forgot I was there and my mother would go roaming the neighbourhood trying to find me. Then, if we played the game of Hogan's Heroes, where was I? I was the one shoveling the dirt at the bottom of the tunnel for their escape route. But probably, you know, the most telling game of all was the game of cowboys and Indians. You see, I was always the one tied to the stake. <laughs> Little did I know how much was at stake here. Because, you see, when your mothers and grandmothers were being raised in the 60s, they were used to constraints happening in their lives to start with. If they got married, they had to give up work. They couldn't even go and drink in a pub. But, as we know, empowered women always come to the cause, and these two empowered women chained themselves to a bar at the Regatta pub, just down the road. Now, I hope you do feel the empowerment of this South Bank precinct, because just across the road is our state parliament, where women were fighting for other things there. You see, they were fighting for the right to vote. I want you to listen to the then politician, Don McIntosh, what he had to say. If they get the franchise or the vote, they'll be saying to their husbands, look here, I'm going to a meeting. You can stop at home and mind the children. That's how the women's vote will be. By and by, there will be no more children. <laughs> well, you can bet your bottom dollar she didn't go to that meeting because guess what? She was too busy sitting at home minding the 14 children that she bore for him. Sadly, when I leafed through this biography, there was no mention of her at all until her obituary. She was known only as the late Mrs. Donald McIntosh. 
Too late for me, you see. She was my great-grandmother. But what does this mean for us today? Have things changed? Well, I can tell you, for my great-grandmother, life was no box of chocolates. She knew exactly what she was going to get out of life. But I think today for women, we now have more choices. We could now say that our life is more like a message in a bottle. You had a program installed in you long before you were born. By the time you were six, they had formed well-etched neural pathways. Now, at best, they would tell you not to touch a hot plate. But at worst, if enough people have told you enough time that you are not good enough, you are not smart enough, or you are not extraordinary enough, then that message is going to sink into your brain too. Well, as 21st century women, nobody cares if we are a prime minister, a ditch digger, a pole dancer, a sex worker, or a neuroanatomist, as long as we remain to be a good wife, mother, lover, cook, and at the same time remain well-groomed and unaggressive. There's probably no group in society who tries hard as women to be everything for everybody else. And at what cost? Men still have a total fixation with anything below our navels, don't they? And it's not our legs they're interested in. If we look at things in Australia, we can see that misogyny and sexism is rife. Only 37% of women, 37%, hold senior positions. 2.5% chair um, a board. And if we... Um, to go and look at other figures, the Global Gap Gender Report reports all sort of inequalities in women. Breen Brown calls her America the most obese, medicated, addicted society. And for a lot of people, they may get dismayed, or they may say what other speakers have said, just shrug their shoulders and say, mm. and for me, as compassion and empathy fatigue, started to settle in, I just shook my head and thought to myself, wow. And as I struggled with this, I got a phone call from my daughter. She walked out of a medical lecture and she said to me, Mum, I know you're collecting statistics. Would you like to hear this one? She said, Mum, what do you think is the greatest cause of death of women in Australia between 24 and 35? And I had a pause because I really didn't want to know the answer. And when she said suicide, I felt sick. And I was in utter disbelief because this wasn't my world and I wanted to change it and I didn't know what was wrong, what, what was going on in their life to make them feel so stressed that they had to end it. And as usual, I'm always rescued by somebody. And a wonderful Australian doctor by the name of Libby Weaver threw some very challenging questions to me. And I'd like to throw them to you now too. Because they ask you the question of where you might be way back there when this fragility is going, going to enter into you to shake the very foundation of who you are. Do you suffer from... Poor sleep, raise your hand, no sleep. Do you wake up exhausted? Right, this one. Has anyone recently told you that you're gluten intolerant? <laughs> Lactose intolerant? Or do you just feel really edgy most of the time? Ladies, this is common, but it is not normal. You don't have to raise your hand for this one. But can you sit with yourself quietly for 30 minutes without touching a media device? Wow, I heard a few mmms with that one. Do you spike your day up with sugar? Or do you just warm it up with caffeine and cool it down with a nice glass of wine? This is common. 
but this too is not normal because if the person who is really you is on the outside always trying to be so cool while inside your system is churning around and around and around because you're trying to be everything to everybody else, then you can be sure the alarm bells are going off in your wonderful brain and your pituitary gland has heard, I need help, I need help. And so what does it do? And you go into flight and fight mode and you feel like you've got T-Rex ch chasing you and you know what? You may not even know that this is going on, but all the while your bodily functions are being compromised. Your heart rate spins along and then you find that other things go wrong with your respiration and the blood flow that should be going to good bits don't go. And as for your cells, well, they, they run out of nutrition altogether. And as my lovely girls, and I didn't teach them this, would say to me, Mum, you are screwed. Now, if you continue to, to let that fight flight program run and you guys are always living on the edge trying to be everything to everybody else then after a while your your brain says she needs help she needs help and I'll give her the help and you get sick and you may get disease and if worse was to happen you could get depression and the end of the road we know about in that statistic but what can we do? We can go back to the fact that we've got this wonderful brain that can make choices where you can seek out and know what your mindset is and you can use that brain for you to work for you. So what can we do? What can I do? Well, I've got an eight-point maintenance program. Would any of you like to know about it? Well, first thing of your day, You've got to select your thoughts the way you select your clothes. You've got to love yourself like Cinderella and slip into the glass slippers of who you are because there's only one you. Everybody else is taken. The only fairy godmother you need is you. You've got to love yourself enough. Then, when you get up in the morning and go into the bathroom, instead of saying, oh my God, God, when you look at the mirror, don't you look awful? Go and write a sign that says, read it, everybody. Oh, louder. Say this one louder. And you know what? Those advertisers have got it right because when you say that often enough, your wonderful brain releases chemicals called mirror neurons. These mirror neurons work, should I say, and they release the chemicals and they do wonderful things for you. The next thing I do in the morning is I take a texter with me and invisibly I use the Beyond Blue strategy, which is right on somebody's forehead invisibly, make me feel important. You see, when you make other people important, feel important, not only do you lift their self-esteem, but you actually release wonderful chemicals in your own brain that give you a zip that will get you through your day. You see, it turns out our longevity isn't about survival of the fittest, it's survival of the, ki the kindest. When you go into your room and you go to pick up that mobile phone, don't text anybody because this new social network, um, networking is, is just doing terrible things to our brain with unforeseen co consequences. So that if you want that great dopamine feel-good thing to happen to you, call somebody you care about. The next one, as you go to pick your keys up to go outside the door, pick it up with your non-dominant hand. When you use your non-dominant hand, what you do is you establish new neural pathways. And this does amazing things for you because not only does it grow neurons, but it also lowers your body stresses. So when you go to brush your hair or clean your teeth, do it with your non-dominant hand. 
chopsticks. You probably saying, what in the hell's chopsticks got to do with it? Well, if you think you're going to have a bitch of a day, a real bitch of a day, and you can't grin and bear it, try fake smiling. Did you realize that every time you smile, the muscles at the side of your ma mouth release a chemical that do wonderful things like, again, lower those blood, st those stresses that cause you to go into fight and flight. Now, if you don't think you can do that, do something wonderful while you're driving to work. Be really brave and put a chopstick in your mouth. When you put a chopstick in your mouth, it engages the same muscles, and guess what? The people at the stop sign will be in raptures. <laughs> when you go to put your glasses on or take them off, let it be a reminder to you that it's much better to be proactive in your day rather than reactive, because every time you're reactive, that fight-flight cortisol, you know that bad guy that releases the alarm bells? It puts cortisol into your system with too much negativity. So instead of you having to be right all the time, can't sometimes five plus five just equal butterfly? <laughs> and now comes the most empowering thing that you're going to do in your day. Because I know you've all been for a power walk, haven't you? Yes. And when you go to take your, sh take your shoes off and you touch your shoelaces, let them remind you that your, the end of your shoelace is like the cap at the end of the chromosomes in your cells. Now, do you want to know the good news? An Australian molecular biologist, Elizabeth Blackburn, she discovered that the longer your, the end of that cap, it's called a telomere, the longer you live. Wow! And guess what? The younger you look too. So, how do I get these telomeres to keep growing? Well, the best news is it costs you nothing. It's all in the breath. When you are mindful and when you go into meditation, you are in no thought and wonderful healing things happen to you. So love yourself enough to greet yourself in the morning with some quiet time. And if you can't do that while you're standing at an escalator or sitting at your desk, just take some deep breaths because they are the things that counter that fight-flight thing that's going to be your eventual downfall. So whatever it is that power kicks your day, make sure you are the co-creator. Nourish yourself so that you've got a full cup to nourish other people too. Make sure that you know where your mindset is. Find your mind and mind your find. Follow your heart and intuition. They already know what you truly want to become. Just promise yourself today that as you leave this empowered forum, that you will become the CEO of your life. But do it with compassion and, and integrity. And make sure that you monitor thoughts the thoughts that are going to control the power switch of who you are so that nothing turns off the light at the end of your tunnel. Thank you.